I'm Stuart Harrison, lecturer here at RMIT, and I'm with Martin Hook today, senior lecturer here from RMIT. Martin, you're an architect and a practitioner. You run a Perth and Melbourne-based architectural practice and lecture here at RMIT. Tell us a bit about how that works and what the benefits are for having a foot in both camps, so to speak. Fundamentally, I think it's about the manner in which RMIT supports and propagates the notion of the things that architects do in practice as being important. Um, and more than anything, it's about the manner in which um, my practice is underpinned through a research agenda, which isn't necessarily a highbrow thing, it's just more about the fact that we're sort of thinking about what we're doing rather than just doing it. And really the idea is that, is that our work comes out of an understanding of research, an understanding of the way in which what architects do is, is valid, um, both in an academic sense and also in a practice sense. So that's how, um, I guess, being at RMIT affects your practice. How does it work the other way around as well? How does being a practicing architect working on real buildings affect the way you teach students and do research within the I university? Think well, I think there's very certain benefits in that kind of idea of currency and the notion that the teaching is applicable through to real world problems and, and, and kind of engages with, with issues that are, that are sort of immediate. Um, now that doesn't necessarily mean that then we're just simply doing boring um, you know, building projects as far as, as the work is concerned, but the work is actually trying to use the university as a site of speculation about problems that are happening or, or issues. Yeah. So it might be climate change, it might be um, you know, using a new material, it might be engaging with new technologies, it might be sort of you know, being critical about the way that the city is growing or evolving and you know, what to do on the in the sort of edges of the city where it doesn't appear to be particularly designed. You know? I think that there's a, there's a notion that the things that architectural practice faces every day are very useful when placed in an academic environment which is more about speculation than it is about any idea that you know, we're solving things. It's more about let's think about this and without the constraints and the demands of practice, allow ourselves to begin to speculate about a series of ideas and, and you know, lateral ways that you could begin to attack a particular problem. You talked about research before in practice. Is designing research? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's very simply the notion that, that you know, it's about exploring ideas, it's about documenting that exploration, it's about the way in which you think about a problem mm. isn't necessarily about you know, sitting in a corner and, and coming up with an innovative act. You know, most architects have a library, most architects refer to product data, most architects get on a website and have a look at you know, if they're doing, I don't know, if they're doing a, a swimming pool, they'll go and have a look at other swimming pools. You know? find out how other people have done swimming pools. And their swimming pool becomes adds to the body of knowledge about how to do a swimming pool? Absolutely. And, and it, it then should be then drawing on, let's say, being in a true modernist sense, the kind of current swimming pool technology of the time. So, mm. you know, why are we using chlorine when we could use magnesium to, to basically chlorinate the water? You know? mm. And I think that, that there are these notions that incrementally Every architect, if they're doing their job properly, is, is adding to the body of work, which is the history of architecture. So, yeah, that's research in my book. You have quite a close link to construction technology and how things mm. are put together, and you teach in construction technology, technology here, in yeah. the architecture program. Yep. How does that sensibility affect the way in which you approach design? Well, I think it comes out of a... I think it comes out of a heritage of where I was educated and the people that I knew in architecture school in Western Australia at Curtin University, um, where I think there's still the opportunity and the chance in, in WA to sort of pursue the, the modernist dream of the, of the untouched landscape and the, and the iconic 
um, resolution of technology in buildings being able to solve the world's problems. And, and I think that certainly during the 50s and the 60s uh, with people like uh, Hawkins and Sands, um, there was really a notion that in that last mineral boom that occurred then that, that there was some true opportunities for Perth to kind of stamp its place in an international market. And that was done very much through um, an embrace of new technology and using architecture as a kind of uh, a stamping card or, or a sort of beacon of, of that advancement in society, if you like. And, and back then they were, they were sort of using modernism as a, almost as a branding device for the sophistication of a, of a community. So, I mean, I think that um, that attitude then sort of percolated through my education in, in Western Australia. Um, where it was really seen as being, you know, how might you begin to utilise new technology? How might you begin to embrace the manner in which buildings are put together? Um, so that the intent of the way that the architecture is being designed begins to become you know, manifest in the way in which the building is built, just as much as you know, the way that the building is conceived. That sort of approach, the kind of modernist approach or neo-modernist approach, involves a relatively close link to engineering and servicing. How do you tackle those things when you're working in, in practice? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit disturbingly obsessed with building services you know, in, <laughs> in the notion that, I mean, I think that, I think certainly that if you start to take the two paradigms, you, know, you could take a kind of Miesian paradigm of the notion that, that the architecture is pure and the servicing is actually embedded or encapsulated in space within the building um, so that you don't see it, the kind of, you know, uh, the, the sort of not to see approach, mm. if you like. And then on the flip side, Le Corbusier is obviously sort of, you know, basically the diametric opposite of, of Mies in the way in which he's sort of saying, well, you know, if, if we are going to deal with the servicing of the building, then let's see it, let's make it beautiful, let's kind of make everyone know that that is the light fitting that's the delivering light into this space. And I think that those, those two agendas of, of you know, whether you're going to see it or whether you're going to hide it, really begin to drive the way in which we might start to conceive of the sloppy spaces in our buildings so that there's sort of an idea that, well, okay, you know, where's the air conditioning duct going to go and how we're going to conceive of these things. And I mean, I think that that's part of the modernist dictum of, of really, you know, how might you start to maximise the ability of the building to deal with all the other stuff. Um, I think people such as you know, Foster and Piano and, and I, I suppose those still relevant sort of British high-tech and Italian high-tech guys, they, they still have a very healthy position in terms of the way in which they deal with all of the nonsense and it's still a good building. Mm. You know? um, it strikes me that some of the you know, more recent players, and Rem and Herzog de Meuron, probably aren't particularly worried about that stuff and I think often it, it sort of it's to the detriment of the longer life of their buildings. 